Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic Bee Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, send us a tweet on Twitter to at The Organic View, or you can contact me directly at June Stoyer. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. In this special series called The Neonicotinoid View, my special guest co-host Tom Theobald and I will be joined by New Zealand's very own John Hartnell, who operates an exporting company specializing in bee products and is also one of the leading experts on honeybee health. So I would first like to welcome to the show my special guest co-host Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June. And our guest today, Mr. John Hartnell. Good afternoon, John, and welcome to the show. Good morning, June and Tom. Thank you. John, can you please share with our audience about yourself and how you got into beekeeping and also a little bit about your operation? Okay, so uh, I began my interest in in the bee industry about 1976 when I was working for an export company uh, involved in the meat industry. And at that time, we were representing one of the uh, larger packers of honey products in the South Island of New Zealand and I guess it just grew from there and uh, by about by 1983 I had uh, decided that that the apiculture was a career for me and I went out and operated a large apiary operation in in the uh, mid Canterbury area of the South Island of New Zealand uh, two and a half thousand hives and uh, I operated that for some time and then as my interest in export which was always there there um, developed further i uh, elected to focus on the marketing of the product that was something i had a lot of interest in i have a great fascination with the honeybee and it's, it's the most fascinating thing you can become involved in but you can't do everything so uh, my focus was on doing what others weren't able to do which was selling bee products around the world and it's been going on ever since. Um, today we handle anywhere between 500 and 900 tonnes of product annually. Uh, the large percentage of that goes into Europe, but we have, as you'll appreciate, growing demand from Asia, particularly China now, and a lot of focus is going into that market as that, uh, as, I guess as their population wealth grows, their, their interest in, in uh, quality food products is uh, very large. And, of course, uh, honey is one of those quality products. Thank you. John, uh, we don't know a whole lot about New Zealand agriculture as far away as we are, but what we, what we would like to know is how widely the genetically engineered crops have been employed in New Zealand, and more specifically, the neonicotinoids, the systemic pesticides, which are the companion technology and have caused great problems here in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, do you have the systemic pesticides, the neonicotinoids? We, 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 yes, we've had neonics in New Zealand since 1992, but we have no GMO products in New Zealand at all and they're not permitted. Thank you. Uh, have you. Have you seen bee losses the way we have in many other parts of the world? Not really. What, what we, there have been unsubstantiated substantiated reports going back historically, probably back into the uh, 80s, uh, sorry, into the uh, mid-90s and, and perhaps up to about the year 2000, some discussion on it. But we really haven't been able to pinpoint anything directly related to Neonix. In saying that, we have worked very closely with companies like Bayer. We, we have a, a strong relationship with them. In, in the sense that we are very aware that coating, particularly in, in the coating technology, getting that coating technology right makes a massive difference. And we didn't want to see a repeat of what we saw in Europe, where um, the, the dust drift and the, and the, the uh, integrity of the coating was very poor. In New Zealand, we're focused on ensuring we could, we have been able to stop them, but we have been able to make sure that the coating technology is a very high level and we're not seeing the 
the drift issues that you've seen yourselves uh, or perhaps in Europe. Can you share with our audience how much honey does New Zealand actually export and how much does the beekeeping community contribute to the New Zealand economy? Okay, so the honey exports currently sitting about $120 million a year, but it's, it's just a minor byproduct, in fact, of the work we do from a pollination aspect. From a pellet pollination aspect, uh, our contribution and understand that New Zealand is basically a food export nation. That's our primary income. Uh, we're basically, uh, the bee industry is directly contributing to about $4.5 billion worth of uh, value to the country and indirectly another $12.5 billion estimated in the flow-on products that are exported as food from New Zealand. So. Our, our bee sector is, is absolutely critical as far as, 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 a, as a food export nation is concerned. John, do you have Varroa in New Zealand? Yeah, unfortunately we do, yes. Uh, Varroa arrived in New Zealand in the year 2000, uh, arrived through the, we believe, through the, uh, what, the port of Auckland in the North Island. And this year it has finally arrived in Bluff, which is the bottom of the South Island. So we now have for our New Zealand wide, um, much to the horror of the beekeeping community, as you'll appreciate. What? Uh, how does your? Uh, how is your beekeeping community organized over there? What would be a typical beekeeping operation? Are, are they mostly smaller beekeepers? Do you have commercial beekeepers, as we have here in the United States? H how does the beekeeping okay. community break out? Yeah. Good question. We have something like 4,300 beekeepers in the country now. The greater majority would be hobbyist beekeepers with under 10 hives. Um, but the, 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 the true ownership is in the commercial sector. And uh, the size of those apiary operations will vary from 500 up to 15,000 hives per operation. Uh, we don't have a huge number of commercial beekeepers, obviously, but um, the large majority of those, I think we're up to about 435,000 hives now, a large, about 90% are owned by the commercial sector. You uh, recently have acquired varroa mites. How has the beekeeping community responded to that, and, and how big a problem do you think it is for your beekeepers? Well, um, to put it into perspective, before the year 2000, uh, we, the New Zealand was running about 300,000 commercial colonies, but alongside that, um, developing over 100 years was probably another 300,000 wild or feral beehives that are operating side by side with the commercial sector. Obviously, when Varroa went through, we lost effectively 50% of our pollination workforce. So it made a, a big dent in, in, in our ability to pollinate, uh, particularly the free pollination, those people with an apple tree and a pear tree in their backyard, etc. they noticed the effect of varroa very quickly because uh, without the ability or without man intervening, of course, those varroa mites destroyed those uh, hives that weren't protected, if you like, in a, in a colony as we know them. Um, and so we had a massive fall, fall back in our pollination workforce. Uh, we're, we're gradually building that back up now. I think we're close to 435 or 440,000 hives now. Um, a large percentage of those are used every year in pollination. That pollination varies, starts with uh, the kiwi fruit industry and it goes through it through pip fruit, stone fruit, um, the, the uh, berries, and then we have a very much a, a growing need in the in the South Island now for hives or small vegetable seed pollination. We have a large export operation going now, uh, exporting vegetable seeds to the world. And um, there's a, a great demand now for hives in that particular pollination sector as well. John, what I think many of us would like to know is a little bit about the nature of agriculture and to what extent the neonicotinoids are used on some of these major crops. Do you, can you tell us that? Sure. Um, so, from a beekeeping perspective, one of the largest crops we, we actually involved in pollination with is the kiwi fruit industry. It's, it's now a billion dollar industry in New Zealand, so uh, very important. So we have a, a large group of hives that go into that particular area. There are some uh, neonicotinoids used in, in application on those orchards, but we have some very strict rules as far as beekeeping is concerned. 
uh, when these can be can be applied and uh, the 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 Kiwi fruit industry is extremely aware of, of the challenges that, uh, that, that, that we face as an industry to make sure that we're capable of doing the job they require. So we have a, a very strong relationship there. The neonics are also used in some pip fruit and stone fruit and also uh, as, a, as a spray, treatment spray on some of the vegetable brassicas and, and, and perhaps things like lettuce. But the, the, by far the greatest use is in the uh, seed treatment application. And we're, we basically have three products in New Zealand, Cruiser, Gaucho, and Poncho. And they are being used on uh, a maize. We, we grow a lot of maize in New Zealand. Also on the cereals, foraging brassicas, some of the uh, vegetable seeds that we are, we are producing uh, in New Zealand. Uh, some of the, that uh, production is also being used with the neonicotinoids, sorry. Uh, it's a tough word. <laughs> it's a tough word. It gets me every time. So um, it, it's definitely being used, but being used um, with some fairly uh, rigid rules, particularly the, the uh, topical treatment, the spray treatments, um, we're very conscious of uh, and, and concerned about that. Because as you, I'm sure you're aware, Varroa changes the health of a hive quite dramatically. Before Varroa, New Zealand had very, very healthy bees. But obviously Varroa comes along and it changes the balance in the hive and uh, opens up the bee's body uh, and it's far more susceptible than it was before to viruses and bacteria and obviously chemicals as well. Has New Zealand undertaken any monitoring of the neonicotinoids in water, plants, uh, soil, bees? Are you tracking it closely? We, we have a, a, a chemical residue program where we test every year for chemical residues in, in our, our, our bee products. Uh, particularly our, you know, hive products, honey, wax, etc. Um, that's just part of our our whole quality assurance program that we operate. Um, there has been some work done on, on neonics, but by far not, you know, certainly not enough. And obviously, we have concern as an industry, but we 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 certainly haven't experienced some of the challenges that, the challenges that you, you've talked about yourselves and what we've seen in Europe. Thank you. John, one of the issues that's been coming up more and more here in the United States is the exposure to ornamental plants that have been treated by neonicotinoids and also the household chemicals that are available to homeowners that contain neonicotinoids. I'm just wondering, are you experiencing any of those issues and is there any type of public education and outreach to allow homeowners to understand what some of the potential hazards can be from using these chemicals on their home environment. We have a very strict system here in New Zealand. Uh, our Environmental Protection Authority are extremely vigilant as far as uh, the entry of any new chemical into the country. It's would be a, I would say a fairly fair comment to say that from a, a home gardener perspective, they don't get their hands on these products. We, we're not allowing that to reach those areas where any chemicals are allowed to go out to the home gardener. There's some very strict labelling requirements on those, and we, we're very conscious of, of that particular issue. So I would say that we've got a pretty good system in New Zealand. It's relatively strict. And um, I mean, we're just going through it one at the moment, which has um, just come through now. I think it's by Thor or something like that. And it was, it's for the treatment of ants. Uh, but it's only going to be permitted to be uh, used by, by professional applicators. It will not be available to um, mum and dad to use. What is the procedure for either a lawn care specialist or any applicator for that matter? In general, what is the process in order to be able to apply these chemicals? Is there a special license that you need to apply yeah, they're, for? They're, they're licensed applicators. Um, they come up, we have a, a, an organization here called AgCalm. You can look them up and they specialize in ensuring that um, that the spray applicators, the commercial op operators, uh, are extremely aware of their requirements to to follow strict labelling requirements on on their containers, etc. And they have a lot of involvement with those uh, particular applicators to ensure that there is an educational program. We have we hand out ourselves on their behalf um, about five thousand 
ferocious a year to, to people spraying products. And these are basically continually pointing out the need to protect the honeybee and to ensure that that people in a commercial licensed environment absolutely follow the rules. Thank you. What about farmers that choose to plant the treated seeds? Are the directions very clear and are the guidelines and the regulations very strict as far as the planting and any use of these chemically treated products. What we're finding here in the U.S., especially with the Jim Doan case, in which he's a a New York State commercial beekeeper whose bees were exposed to newly planted corn that was treated with a neonicotinoid, unfortunately... Yeah, I think I saw that in the ogen. Yeah. There was no direction, there was no there's no regulation, there's no nothing. So yeah. what have you done in New Zealand to prevent that type of a situation from happening there? Because maybe there's something that other parts of the world can learn from the steps that you've taken in New Zealand to protect the beekeepers. Okay, so so what the one the one very obvious one that we got involved with in quite early was um the type of drills that are used by the farming community to put these seeds in the ground. And obviously uh, we were able to look at what had happened over in Europe with the uh, the dust drill, the, you know, the air, the air pressure dust drilling type um, seed planters. And we were able to work uh, around that and to ensure that, that the drills that are being used in New Zealand don't don't create the, uh, the, the residue that, that we were seeing in, the, in, the, in Europe. Uh, the dust cloud type of issue. And that combined with um, some very uh, strong uh, work on the integrity of the coatings being used, we believe we have, to our best ability, minimised the, the, the impact of, of those coated seeds when they're planted. And we, we don't have reports of uh, any bee losses when, when seeds are being planted that I'm aware of. Thank you, John. Can you talk about some of the programs that you're doing that help encourage people to create zones that are friendly for the honeybees and other pollinators so that they can forage for food safely? Sure. So so one of the big things that we – what we have had in New Zealand, obviously, is, as you know, we are now a very large uh, dairy export uh, country, um, and we're now a very large exporter of vegetable seeds. So we've seen some quite dramatic change in the farming landscape from what historically in New Zealand would have been a mixed cropping and beef and lamb farm to to large now monocultural farms, either in dairy or large scale uh, arable. With that, we've seen the removal of uh, of the shelter belts that were, were, were put there by our forebearers to stop the wind, etc. And we've also seen the removal of things like gorse hedges and broom and some of those uh, excellent pollen resources that the honeybee had historically. Um, obviously, the shelter belts were created a pathway for the bee to fly when the wind was blowing. And of course, we had the gorse and the broom, which were very high in pollen nutrition um, and very important to us. What we recognised four or five years ago was as this farming landscape was changing, that we had to take a proactive approach to it. It's all right sitting here and grizzling about it, but you might as well get out and do something about it. So we started uh, five years ago with a, a small project called Trees for Bees, and we went right through the country and we, we uh, developed 10 planting guides which were suited to certain regional climates, and we worked with the beekeeping community and, and the farming community and worked out what were the, as a starting point, what were the best pollen resources that we could plant to assist uh, the honeybee. And we've built on that from there, and this, the last three years we've been operating uh, with a, a million dollar project uh, developing more knowledge on pollen and the value of pollen and what that value is to the honeybee. And we now are building up a massive library of, of information on that. But alongside that, part of the project is we've, been, we've got now two demonstration farms in the South Island, two demonstration farms in the North Island, where we have planted uh, uh, along some areas of, of not wasteland, but we have riparian strips and things here, which we, we have to be fenced these days so that the water quality is protected. And what we've been doing is working with those farmers to plant uh, trees that are suitable pollen-bearing trees for the honeybee 
and we've been targeting mainly the spring and the autumn period. Obviously, the summer period, there's a lot of pollen around. We have issues about pollen buildup and pollen availability in the spring, and the same in the autumn when we'd like to see our bees going, if you like, going into a semi-hibernation state uh, with good pollen, uh, good healthy and, and, and high nutritional pollen in the hive. And that's proving to be very successful. We had a very big uh, buy-in from both the urban and rural communities and uh, we're, we're just moving into our next three years of that project. And by the time it's finished, we're going to be have some extremely valuable resources that will be available to, to all beekeepers around the world, uh, which will spell out what pollens um, uh, are, are best and which have got the highest nutritional level at the right time of the year so that we get a very good spread of pollen right through the, the working season of the honeybee. John, if the beekeepers will indulge me for just a bit, here in the United States, I have a specifically beekeeper question. Here in the United States, the dandelion is a very important crop for us. It signals the end of winter. And I'm curious, do you have the dandelion? Is it as important for New absolutely, Zealand beekeepers? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely important. It's a very, got a very high in fatty uh, pollen and the bees, as you know, absolutely love it. It does play part of part of um, of our pollen resource, though it's not something obviously we plant. It's a it's a wild thing, but um, but no, it's certainly uh, we do get some dandelion honey, not very much, but it's got a, a, a extremely good pollen, and uh, the bees love it. Thank you, John. How did you get them to work with you, John? I'm kind of fascinated that you're able to dictate what you want, and you have the EPA working with you as well as the chemical companies. Yep. We have. They don't do that in Europe and they don't do that in the United <laughs> States, but in New Zealand, you got them to do it. I, I'm just curious, what was your... Well, we, we, your... we decided that there's no point in fighting them. We might as well work alongside them. And um, with, with that approach, it's, it's been a very successful. Um, we have, a, as I say, we have a great relationship with the EPA and we have a good working relationship with companies like Dow and Bayer now. Um, obviously, they have uh, chemicals that they are new chemicals they want to bring in. But we, we now sit with the EPA and the chemical companies and we go through that and we were just, we've just been through a process with a, a new chemical recently. It's taken two years for us to have sufficient information supplied to, the, to, us, to us, I mean by us, the bee industry, before we would accept what they were saying. So we have, in fact, uh, when they first came to talk to us through the EPA, we sent them back and said there was insufficient information and they gave us the courtesy and went back and did the extra work. And, and I guess that's that working relationship that, that uh, does make a difference for us. Um, one, of the more, one of the more recent controversies here has been the introduction of a pesticide called sulfoxiflor. And I know that the New Zealand beekeepers objected to its introduction in 2011. Correct. Has it yep. been used in New Zealand? No, or? no that, that's, the, that's the one we've just, we're just working through now. That's, that's taken two years, and we've been working with them on that. Um, we're at a point now where we are having input into the labelling requirements and, and how strict those uh, labelling, or how, how strict the use is going to be. And, this, and I can I'll probably email you through an idea of the type of wording that we're using and the strict specifications that are being put on those labels before we would even permit it to even go to its final acceptance hearing. Gutation is an issue that we can't seem to get answers on. And uh, there have been discussions amongst the bee community, uh, particularly in the area of maize after harvesting and whether or not we are seeing the chemical, if you like, leaching at the wound where the maize has been cut and whether when we get a very dry summer in New Zealand, whether the bees actually are going there to forage uh, or to get moisture or water or whatever. And I just wonder if there's any work being done on that because it's an area that we, uh, we don't seem to be able to get any answers on. John, I'm interested to know just how large a role corn, what you call maize, occupies in New Zealand agriculture. Do you know the acreage or the percentage that's devoted to maize? Um, in, in the North Island of New Zealand, there's some large areas of maize. I can't tell you how many hectares, but um, it might be two and a half thousand or something like that hectares of maize a year. Um, and uh, that's mainly going into 
to uh, feed crops, you know, feed crops, stock feed and things like that. Um, so that's there. And we do get in the areas where we have very dry summers, um, we have had the odd instance where we have seen some bee loss and we haven't been able to actually pinpoint exactly what it is. But that's one of the things that we uh, do continue question uh, the chemical companies about. And it's something we'd like to see some work done on just to see whether there is a, a uh, whether the plant does actually draw up that way and we do see some chemical residue sitting in that moisture at the wound where the plant's been cut. He uh, describes guttation a little differently than we would understand. And that would be an exudate of the plant when it's actually growing in full growth, not after. Yeah, I understand that, Tom. Yeah, I just, I just wonder what happens at that point where we chop the plant and we expose that, uh, if you like, the root and the, and, the, and the bit that just sticks above the ground, what, whether we do see some residue sitting there that the bee could potentially go to if we have a drought condition and moisture, water, water shortage situation. Migration in groundwater is of great concern here in the United States also from crops like corn to be drawn up by non-target plants. And you've Correct. touched yep. upon that, but that's a great concern for us here in the United States. You know, also with us, one of the, the other big challenge I guess I have with the neo uh, particularly the nitro nicks, which seem to have a very long viability, up to a thousand days in the soil, I understand. That's obviously a concern to a country that's growing food products, and uh, we could well have a, uh, a non-flowering brassica for feed being planted, but next year they might put oilseed rape or something over the same ground, and the potential there is that those neonics are still viable and still sitting there, and, and every potential that... Uh, they could be drawn up into the next crop or perhaps the crop after it was third year. So you also grow oilseed rape, what commonly is referred to as canola. Is that seed treated with systemic pesticides? Yes, yes it is, yes. Yep. And there's about there'd be a couple of thousand hectares a year grown now in, in oilseed rape. Okay, just a comment on bee health in New Zealand, which we haven't quite touched on. Um, from a, from a healthy hive perspective, obviously Varroa has changed the, the balance in the hive and we nowadays see some greater challenges than we had before with just the natural viruses and bacteria that are in a hive. But I guess the, 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 other, the other point when we, we hear internationally about large uh, hive losses each year, uh, we do experience some loss in New Zealand, um, but probably in the vicinity of, of 10 to 15 percent as a max and it happens in different regions uh, in different years and, uh, and it's it's more to do i think with with varroa and it's to do with humidity and cold and rain and a whole lot of other things but um but i guess as a summary and very simple I, I think that probably our bees because of varroa are not as healthy as they were historically and um, and that's a challenge that beekeepers uh, face right around the world, and, and certainly in New Zealand, we're we're still fairly new to varroa. Some of our beekeepers have only seen it for just this last autumn for the first time, and uh, as you'll appreciate, it creates some challenges uh, for them to get their head around it. Um, but you know, certainly after the year two, they they're starting to understand exactly what varroa is all about. John, thank you so much for being on the show today. It has been great connecting with you and letting our audience have an understanding of what exactly is going on in New Zealand and the fact that things seem to be very organized over there. And I hope that some of the steps that you've taken will be an example for other parts of the world so that we can figure out how we can protect our honeybees and continue to move forward as opposed to all the the rapid losses that we've been experiencing because obviously that's not something that we want to see continue but uh thank you once again for coming on the show today it's been really really great having you on and learning about you thanks june i think the simple answer to people if they want to understand is that if they look at their dinner plate when they have the evening meal and look at the color on the plate and understand that without the honeybee, there would be no colour, there would be no vegetables, and you might just have you have potato, meat, and grain, which would be probably taking us back to caveman-type 
uh, restaurants in the past. Very, very true. Everyone, we are out of time, but thank you so much for tuning in. And if you've missed a show, you can always subscribe to The Organic View on iTunes or visit our podcast archives at www.theorganicview.com. Have a great day, everyone.